This interview is made possible by the VIEW conference. The biggest computer graphics conference in Italy. This year, our dates are from the 17th to the 22nd of October. And for details about the conference and tickets, please visit the website, viewconference.it. Hi, everybody. My name is Maria Elena Gutierrez. I am the director of the VIEW conference here in beautiful Turin, Italy. I will be your host for today's interview. Today, we are joined by the two directors of If Anything Happens, I Love You, Michael Gauvier and Will McCormack. All right, guys. Well, uh, without further ado, I want to kick this off. What brought you into the film industry? Can you kindly elaborate on that? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Maria. We're so excited to be here with you. I had a long, windy path that is hard to track. I mean, you know, originally when I was young, um, I was an actor and I worked in theater um, and I did plays in New York for a living. And I just love story and I love being a part of the theater community. And then um, I slowly made my way to California and um, I got a couple TV shows and I got a couple films uh, as an actor, but I always secretly wanted to be a screenwriter. So um, I finally sold something. I sold a film and I sold a TV show and uh, my, act, my writing career got a lot better than my acting career. It was also, I felt more me. And so I became a screenwriter, but I really had a, a, a windy path that came from acting to writing and then to, to directing. But I think that they all inform each other and they're all connected. And I think that it was my path. Awesome. I had a similar, a similar experience as Will, where it's just like I had a lot of different things I was doing. I came up through theater as well. Um, I was writing plays uh, for the stage. And then, you know, in theater, you're also, I was also like, you know, designing sets, doing lighting design, doing a lot of these other disciplines that then translated well over to animation and also translated over to film. And it was kind of like, I was basically a lot of times working in the medium that was available to me. So when I came up through school, it was theater. And then I lived in Chicago for a long time. I did a bunch of theater there. And then I started to do short films because those became available. Then I moved to Los Angeles and obviously there's an abundance of film and television here. So then I've just really pivoted and embraced that medium. Um, but at the end of the day, I've just been wanting to tell wonderful stories. And it's just, I've been every time it's just like, well, let's tell a story on the stage. Let's tell a story in a short film. Let's tell a story in a screenplay. And so it's, it's been wonderful to kind of like uh, learn all of them, but they're all connected. Who are the mentors? that have influenced your work, your career, your life? When I was in college, I worked to, for four years, I worked at an independent movie house, a, a beautiful uh, independent movie theater called Cine Studio in Connecticut. And I watched hundreds of films. And, and so my, my um, real North Star for the business was independent film. And I loved um, John Sayles and John Cassavetes uh, they played old films, Billy Wilder. Um, so I was just really entrenched in independent cinema. It never occurred to me that I could work in the movie business, though, because I, where I'm from, no one worked in the movie business. So it wasn't something that I thought was real, you know. Um, but then I then I slowly made my way into the movie business. And, and you know, working at Pixar um, was a great experience for me because I got to work with Michael Arndt, who wrote Little Miss Sunshine and Toy Story 3 who I think technically, I think one of the smartest screenwriters ever. And I got to work with Pete Docter and um, I got to work with Andrew Stanton. And so I learned a lot about storytelling, but I will say that the most I've ever learned on anything is on this film. And uh, Michael and Marianne were such terrific partners and building a movie independently from the ground up is such a great experience because you have to do everything yourself. You're not just writing a screenplay and then giving it to the studio. You're figuring out every facet of filmmaking. And uh, Michael and Marianne were such great partners and they elevated my game in every way. And I learned so much from working with them on this film, more than in my whole career prior to this. It sounds like an incredible labor of love. 
this film is an absolute labor of love and everyone really put their hearts into it. And since it is, you know, an independent film, you know, we pitched it to a lot of places into studios where we thought they might, it might land or they might want it. And they just said, it's too sad. So this is where independent film is <laughs> wonderful. You get to have your full expression and do your full vision. And you don't have to kind of compromise because um, whatever the studio needs it to look like or needs it to feel like you're able to have a full full experience with it how did if anything happens come about can you uh, take me through the process of how it came together for you yeah michael and i met in an acting class in los angeles um we both study acting and um we became friends immediately and we just we're, we're both writers so we would meet and talk about um, stories like writers do. I'll never forget, he pitched me this beautiful idea of this shadow soul that was disconnected from its human host because it was so much in so much agony that they couldn't connect to one another. And it was kind of this very beautiful Jungian image that was a, a really beautiful, concise, um, artful distillation of what grief felt like. And I think that we were both interested in writing about grief and loss and wrestling with those ideas narratively. And then of course, in America, we have a huge uh, problem, an epidemic really, a tragedy that happens over and over and over again. And we thought, what would it be like to write a story from the parent's perspective of losing a child, which is um, unimaginable loss, but um, sadly very common here. Um, and that was really the uh, genesis of the story. And we just built it uh, day by day. It was a, a daunting thing to, to take on, but it was also really uh, rewarding. And I think we just wanted to talk about grief and kind of show what grief looks like. And a lot of times grief, you see it in those little quiet moments. And it's like when, when like the daughter find, or the mother finds the daughter's t-shirt. It's like, it's a little quiet moment of grief. And I think we've all experienced that when a loved one is gone and we find an item of their clothing or, or something that is theirs, that's very personal, that floods all those memories of them and, and brings them back to life in a way. And also brings back all, all the grief and, and all that. And we want to show all of those little moments and kind of what the quiet moments are of grief. Uh, tell me why you chose um, animation as your medium to tell the story rather than live action, for example. Well, first of all, we love animation um, and we love the opportunities that animation presents. You know, I think that, um, like Michael said, everyone, when we pitched this story, they told us it was too sad. And we disagreed. I think that all types of stories can be told in animation. And we think specifically this story for us as storytellers could only be told in animation. There's something about live action that would just be too horrific and coarse. And there's something about animation that gives you a gateway into the story. And I think allows you even more intimacy. And of course the shadows to me and to Michael will always be more interesting in animation than they ever could be in live action. So it just felt right 
Um, and to us, I think it's an exciting time in animation because there's all new kinds of stories that are being told. And animation, you know, historically, frequently is relegated to sort of a kid space, sort of cartoons. And we feel like that's changing and we're excited to be a part of that. And we give special shout out to Netflix for um, distributing and, and facilitating um, new kinds of animation that are exciting in the world today. I've just been a huge fan of animation and I've been writing different scripts and a lot of different ideas in it. And it's so wonderful to have one kind of come to full fruition. And I do agree this story can only be told in animation. And I'm so proud that we were able to put, you know, one, our little brick in the giant wall that is animation to kind of keep moving um, animation forwards and getting it the respect that it deserves, that it is film. You know, it is, it's not this other lane. It's, it's, it's part of the whole and the stories that people are telling in animation are part of all film. And, and I think it really is, is uh, getting the, the recognition it deserves. And I, I hope it will continue. We love short films. You know, I think you can have as full of an experience in 12 minutes as you can have in 120. So I also think it's an exciting time for short films because they're really getting a lot of attention and it's a great medium. I found that your choice of seeing it through the eyes of the parents made it so much more personal. Did you always know that you wanted to narrow the story to one couple? We always knew it was just going to be one couple and we always thought if we just focus on one couple and the the girl the daughter that it would you would kind of show the whole world and we wanted to show like you know and a lot of times when when parents lose children you know they get divorced or they have more problems because of the loss of the child however the child was lost and so we wanted to show like that that strife and pain that is created when such a huge wound happens in a family. And so that was always, and then we thought as far as the overall um, talking about school shootings, rather than talking about, you know, a lot of people that were lost lives, we just wanted to focus on one family. So you could see the impact of just one life lost is like too many. And you can see the impact and you'll know the ripple effect of one life being gone. That's really well put. I love that, Michael. We always knew that we wanted to tell the story um, from the parents' perspective. It was the first idea we had. And um, again, it was, it was a very challenging thing to write because um, it's heavy. It's the heaviest possible story. Um, but the souls, the, the sort of shadows helped us as these sort of guides. Why did you decide to uh, hold the reason for the couple's grief until late? in the film. We always talked about the girl, that her shadow being the, the engine for story. And, and had she not come back on that day, I mean, the goal of the girl is to get them into the room and to, to have them face one another, which I think in grief that, you know, horrific and, and unthinkable is maybe the only thing one can do is, is um, be available to, to your partner. Um, so uh, it worked in terms of story because you know, they are so divided um, when the film begins. And then there's a slow process of them um, coming together and being in the same room and looking at one another and then actually talking about her life. And in that moment, at least, having her life define her and not her death. And that was always important to us. And then I think at the end, when they actually do touch, um, there's an actual physical connection and um, nothing will ever be fixed and, and nothing will ever be the same. And, and that pain will be there forever. But at least for a moment, they're there for each other. And um, that was always important to us that we, we took that route for the parents, that the girl would be the one to bring them together. Yeah, and, and the film has multiple feelings. Like it opens, you feel like this is a divorce film. And it is. It is a divorce film at that moment. Then you start to realize what is causing that and you find out the cause, they've lost a child. Then you kind of find out how this child, you know, passed away. And, and we wanted, like Will is saying, just to echo, it's like the child's goal 
And the parents kind of goal is to celebrate the wonderful time they had together. They had 10 years and it's not, it's like it, it was a tragedy that happened, but that didn't define that daughter's life. That is just how it ended, but it's like she, they had 10 years of life and we wanted to show that in the memory and show that there is a wonderful life. And that also is bringing back this discussion, which hopefully will bring back some healing. The film is utterly minimalistic. It's very beautiful. Can you elaborate a bit about your process and how you uh, arrived at that style for the movie? We, we always knew we wanted to be very minimal and very lean and we were very um, and early on we had some exploratory art and we created some things and and it just the fuller frame and too many components in it was very distracting from the story and it actually pulled you out of the emotions because you started to like go oh look how beautiful that tree is look how nice that house is look at the texture on that and it kind of pulled you out of story and so we were so lucky to work with young Reno who's the animation director and she had recently just graduated from Cal Arts it was just kind of a perfect pairing and we we're able to create this minimal look like one example if you see the film or if you go watch it again you see when the mother comes up the stairs the stairs actually appear behind her as she's moving and then so it's like that appeared to, when it needed or when you look in the bedroom, you see the bedroom and then everything disappears and it's just the bed. So we only use the items to infer what the world is, but then it kind of really focuses your attention on what those moments are. Yeah, we wanted it to be completely spare. We wanted it to feel barren, like grief and sort of lonely. Um, and uh, to echo Michael, you know, we sort of had a cardinal rule that anything that didn't need to be in frame, we would remove it. So we kept stripping the film and stripping it just to its bare essentials, because we thought that that would hang in a lantern on the emotionality of the scenes, um, because grief that acute is very intense. So we just wanted to focus on the emotion. And it seemed to work well in the memory section of the film too. Uh, I think, you know, that's how implicit memory works. When you remember the past, you don't remember everything that was in a room per se, but you do remember how you felt. So we, were, we wanted the film to be an emotional, visceral experience. And the leanness of the style really supported that. So we kept stripping and, it, and it, was, it, it was also scary because in a movie with no dialogue, you think, oh, will it support this? But um, once we did, it, it, it paid dividends. It was very rewarding uh, in terms of style. One thing we did that we, had, we learned and, and worked through was since we wanted this lens of grief to be through the whole film, when we went back to memory, you know, one thought is like, okay, it'll be in color. We'll start to see more color about the memory because you remember it. But we still then wanted to be through the lens of grief because the parents are still in the bedroom having these discussions of things that had happened. So on the edge of frame, it's still kind of grazed and washed because that is... The, the present moment of grief. And that was uh, an aesthetic because we did an early one where it's a jump to color and it was, it was way too much color and it instantly pulled you out of the film because it felt like two different things. And then we realized it needed to continue that feeling the whole time. What creative sources did you use? What informed your choice for the style? We watched hundreds. I mean, we're, we're, we love short films and we love short animated films. So we watched thousands of them. And also like if you saw ink drawings from like the turn of the century where people would put them in newspapers and you saw those kind of sketches and, you know, before they had photographs and things. So we looked at a lot of pen and ink drawings. Um, you know, Edward Gorey to an extent, but his are very detailed ink drawings. And we said, okay, what if we stripped these kind of thoughts away and had this kind of um, what, what our animation director kind of calls this kind of scratchy style. And so it was kind of the scratchy style was kind of what we are shorthand for the aesthetic of the physical drawings. Why did you choose a bright blue, the paint on, on the wall and also the t-shirt, which become kind of like enchanted objects in the storytelling. We thought color, we thought about color a lot and how it matters. And we wanted to really activate everything um, the daughter had touched 
that meant something, you know? And so then we wanted just to connect them all together. And also we just talked about, we figured, you know, this, this girl, her favorite color is blue. And she's like, of course, that's her. She, her she, she's the one who picked out that T-shirt when they went on the family trip, you know, and of course, when they had to fix the wall that the dad is upset about, but they're like, fine, we'll fix the wall. She's like, oh, I've got this blue paint. Of course she does, because that's her favorite color. So it was always this thing. And then we wanted that to pop out to show, like we were talking about those items that are still activated with kind of the soul of the, the daughter still here on earth. You know, and so the T-shirt's brighter than everything else. The, the wall, the, the scar on the wall is brighter and it's activated because that was her and she kind of touched it. I, I had one other point about the color blue, which is also there's something about blue that's sort of very open and intuitive and also inviting. Um, and it's the ocean and the sky. And, and there's something about this story that feels like it's also sort of dancing in both worlds, right? Like the here and there. Um, and I think that's also what grief feels like, that you're caught between two worlds. Um, you know, in that type of loss, I think you're sort of um, floating in between two worlds and blue kind of feels like a baton between those two worlds. Were there other colors that you were purposefully using? Yes, absolutely. We, we thought about color a lot and we, at the beginning, we wanted it like more, you know, grays, earth tones. There's some dark, there's some browns in there. Some there's some very muted greens that are in the front half of the film until you see like the blue shirt that kind of pops a little more. And then as we move into memory, we wanted the memory to have, you know, when they at dinner and you see the fireflies, there's more, it feels more like love and there's, and there's purples and violets and these other colors. And then as you move through to the end of the film, we're back at the bedroom and the bedroom started in grays and muted earth tones and it ends in warm ambers. So we wanted to have that flow to also show hope and love at the end of the film in these kind of amber colors and um, soft, soft, warm light. It was exciting to talk about this progression of color and just from muted to more fuller in the memory when the daughter's around because she will bring vibrancy to the film, you know? there's a million decisions to make on a 12 minute film. And this was so detailed in every way because um, we wanted to be exact, to get it exactly right. Uh, but Michael, Michael's, Michael really visually and in terms of style, um, I, I really feel like he was the leader. He had such a great idea and I really followed his lead. He's just naturally gifted, I think, when it comes to tone and tenor and color and style. Were the subconscious emotional elements always going to appear as shadow characters? The shadows were always going to be shadows. And that was kind of the main concept and pitch from the beginning. Um, the shadows were going to represent that part of you that can't connect. Either it's your grief, it's the other part of the soul, it's the, your, your shadow self that's out of alignment. And it was always going to be represent that. And as we developed them, um, we wanted it to be free. So it's almost like they could move kind of like a ghost where they're not tethered literally like a shadow where the shadow has to touch in the frame to the person and then go up here. They could actually move in any direction and have free will because they're kind of a soul. It is your other half, your other part of you that's disconnected and it's physically represented by it that they are disconnected. So they are always were shadows. Um, and then when the daughter shadow appears, that brings them kind of on this journey through um, the life they had and understanding all those wonderful times. And it's the shadows that are that part of you that's grieving, that's trying to reconnect with you, um, that you're actually physically seeing on screen. Yeah, it was exciting to give the shadows, like Michael says, autonomy, that they could move throughout the story and that they weren't tethered to their human hosts. You know, I mean, even in the opening frame, the, the mother and the father, their shadows are flipped. So, so right there, we're, we're trying to tell the audience that these are, they have a, a life of their own and they're disconnected and they're um, in agony and it will take the daughter to uh, realign them at least for that day. And that was an exciting challenge and also it's a challenge because if you think of the film, I think it's easy to think it's like, oh, well, there's only three characters. There's the parents and the daughter. 
And it's like, there's actually six because each of them has a double and each of the doubles have a different perspective and different feeling. So like on any given frame, there's like four emotional states or even six emotional states going on at once. And so it was, that was something realizing it was like, oh, wow, we actually have a very big cast. It's not a small <laughs> cast of three. And so that's something to manage of who is taking the focus and who are we, whose story are we telling in this exact frame? The film is emotionally charged and very intense. What did you do to, to get some emotional distance from it? You know, everyone has said, you know, that they've cried when they've watched this film. I don't know if you know it. It went viral on TikTok where there was this experiment where people were basically, you know, filming themselves before watching it in the middle and then after. And at the end, everyone is most of the time crying. And then they're saying things like, I'm going to go hug my parents. I'm going to go hug my grandma. I'm going to go hug my grandfather. And they had that. And we have had that same experience for like two or three years making this film. It's like we have cried a lot and had a lot of big feelings, you know, because we've been with these characters for so long. And there's, I mean, I still, um, you know, I watched the film two days ago again and, um, you know, it brought, it brings tears to my eyes. And I think it, it brings up all these emotions. And I think the emotions hit for me with each rewatch at a different point because you know the full story and you start to see the pain in different ways. And like the other day, it was um, when the blue, when the dad sees the blue spot, that one just completely hit me because it's like, I know what the blue spot is and he would give anything in his life to have a, a bad day where something was broken on your house back to have her back. And it's like, and it's like those moments just keep hitting me and they've hit us through this whole process. Yeah, I think there was hard days on the movie because it's very heavy material. Um, but with that said, you know, we had each other and um, it's, it's also, Maria, you know, it's, it's, as you said before, it's, you know, this is also therapeutic, right? It's cathartic and it's also really rewarding. So, you know, to have the opportunity to connect with other people through loss and grief brings, bring, has brought us closer to, you know, our fellow man and woman. So um, at the end of the day, um, it's just made us feel more connected to people. And um, that's, that's, it was an incredible thing that I don't think we ever expected. You know, when you're making a tiny movie, really, truly, you're just trying to be authentic. Your collaboration with the different gun control groups you worked with, every town for, for gun safety and with the grieving parents. What kind of insight did you gain from those collaborations? We connected with Every Town for Gun Safety early on in the process um, for a couple of reasons. One, because we really love and admire the work that they do. Um, but two, as storytellers, uh, we wanted to make sure that this story felt true and authentic to loss and to grief and that we were being mindful and respectful um, and sensitive to, to the ones lost and, and to the ones um, here. They gave us uh, the blessing on the script and they, they said, we're in your corner and we'll do whatever we can to support you. And that felt really empowering as storytellers. We felt, you know, to be aligned with them uh, was important. And then we had a, we had a, a large screening uh, at the United Talent Agency and um, uh, a lot of survivors and a, a lot of people who, who've lost loved ones to gu gun violence were, were there. And um, they said that the film spoke to them and they felt seen and they saw themselves and their loved ones in the story. And that was really, I think, maybe the best feeling you could ever have as a storyteller is that type of connection. And a lot of people have reached out to us who've lost loved ones to gun violence and all, all types of loss. Uh, and it's very humbling and heavy, but also very uh, cathartic and rewarding. It's an incredible feeling and, and one that, again, I don't think we had ever expected, you know. It has been surprising and wonderful and humbling how many people have reached out who've lost loved ones that this film is connected to. And it's, it's out even past the scope of gun violence. We have people who said, I lost, you know, my grandparents. I lost a loved one during the pandemic. I've, you know lost you know children i've lost family members to cancer and they said this film reminded them and of of the loss and and also the grief that they went through so it's been this very um bonding experience 
through grief. And we feel like we've connected to all of these different communities. And it's been incredible for, for people opening up their hearts and sharing their stories where they might never would have, especially with us. I mean, people are like sharing their stories and, and it's so kind and uh, welcoming. Can you tell me uh, which sequence was the most difficult one to achieve and, and why? I'll answer it two ways. There was difficult sequences as far as just like building out the sequence for timing and animation. And that's just like maybe a technical sequence that was challenging. And then there's actually a sequence that was actually the most minimal design as far as animation goes. And that was kind of during the shooting sequence. It's just literally one still frame and the camera slightly pushes in. But that little moment, we probably spent more physical time on with the sound and the design and working with uh, you know Michael Babcock, who's the sound designer and getting that sequence and making it um, just, just kind of work. And, and not to be exploitive and not to kind of glorify anything, but also to show that this was what's happening. And I think that sequence took a lot of time and a lot of discussion. I would agree with that. I think that the school scene was the one that we were uh, most sensitive about and, and spent the most time on and, and wanted to make sure that it felt um, thorough and thoughtful and not exploitative in any way, but um, true to the story. So that one took a lot of special care and attention. Is there um, a favorite moment in the film? I love the opening scene, honestly, because it tells so much story in a frame and you really get a lot of information. To me, I think it was just a great gateway into the world where you're able to tell um, a lot in a small amount of time. And that I think is such a, like what we're all trying to achieve in, in storytelling is to be very laconic, you know, laconic and lean and but also fill it with the essential information that one needs. And I thought that it was just a great uh, opening to the film. And um, I, my hats off to Young Rand, who's so brilliant. My favorite one is the kind of the visualization of the concept, um, what if, or if I could take that back. Like that walk to school with the girl and the shadows, all they're trying to do is stop her. If they could take back that day, everything would be okay. If they could take that back, what if? Um, I think all of us have had those moments. What if that person hadn't driven that day? What if this other thing hadn't happened? And I think that is a visual representation of a concept that I think all humans have gone through at some point. And if they haven't, that's wonderful, but uh, they might. <laughs> and I think it's where you wish you could take back one moment, um, which you can't, but I think that visualization and that thought then leads to healing and leads to acceptance and it leads to growth. But I think we all have to start with that, that concept because so that's the pain of like, you get hyper-focused on this moment and say, if I could fix that, I could fix everything. And then I think working through that leads to a greater growth and, 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 uh, health. What do you think makes uh, this particular story um, especially important to uh, today's audiences? There's something about the film that, you know, is, is every kid's worst fear and, and, uh, and also is every parent's worst fear. So, um, you know, we're, we're all going through a lot of uh, loss and, and big, heavy feelings uh, in the world right now. And um, there's something about the film that was an opportunity for people to feel and to emote and to show up and to be vulnerable and to be angry and to cry. And um, that's been an incredible experience. Um, uh, we're very humbled by, by the reaction and the opportunity to talk to you and, and the, 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 all the people who've, who've shown up to the film. So um, I just hope people get to show up to the movie and feel their feelings because it's important. You know, you got to let it out. <laughs> Netflix and other platforms are bringing a huge diversity of animated films to a whole new audience. Do you think this is a new golden age for animation? Yes, 100%. More? We'll call it right now and say it has started. We feel it started. More people are doing animation. More people are accepting animation. 
And I think all these streamers are, are wanting to use it. And there's so many ways to get it out now. You know, I mean, if you think, you know, old, the old times of animation, the only people who uh, were doing it, you know, it was in front of feature films. And it was, you know, so you, you only was able to get to a certain lane, you know, you can be on any kind of streamer, YouTube, any kind of way to get the film out there. And, and I think it's a wonderful, thing. and everything else is becoming more accessible, just like, you know, how people make shorts on their phone, everyone's making their own, you know, their own animated film on their laptop. So it's becoming more accessible everywhere. And I think the technology is helping more people uh, get in and be taken seriously. Yeah, and it's just happening now. I mean, when we took our film to Netflix, they were like, oh, this is great, but we don't do short films really. And now they do. So that's really cool. <laughs> and I, I think that the rest of the world maybe is a little bit more advanced than America and doing different types of more sort of adult sophisticated animation. And I think that it's happening here in America. I mean, if you look at, I just am reading about new TV series that are more adult focused and, and uh, you know, I saw, I, I read that they're doing the great Gatsby in animation and I just think it's an exciting time. So it's fun to be a part of it. Art is often creating a singular vision, yet filmmaking is a collaborative process. Can you please speak to that? Well, I think film is a collaborative, it's a team sport. And you need all these components on the team. You need a composer. You need um, all these people to put come together to build this up. And I think you know a director and a writer's job is to kind of take the best components of that everyone is bringing together and amplify them into a focus. And kind of like a conductor is conducting. A conductor doesn't play every instrument, but a conductor helps focus the orchestra to get this pure um, creation uh, out into the world. Yeah, every single person who played a part in this film was essential. I mean, truly, we couldn't have made the film without every single person's contribution, truly. Um, and that was cool because when everyone's moving in the right direction and adding towards the same goal, cool things can happen. Can you tell me what is next for you? Uh, will you be directing features? Yes, we've, we've written a short. We've already started another animated short and we're working on um, an animated feature, trying to figure a lockdown, a few of those things. So yes, we will have more in animation and we can't wait to get it out and can't wait to talk more about it. If you can conclude giving us some advice, some words of encouragement for young filmmakers out there, who dream of becoming directors and animators. Don't ever give up. I mean, you know, we, we heard the word no on this movie hundreds of times and we just believed in the story and we believed in each other and we just kept going. You know, no is a part of the process and doubt is a part of the process. And those are all creative tools. I mean, you know, in, in fact, we're, we were fueled by some of that because that meant it wasn't the right thing. But in terms of when it comes to story, you know, I would say, uh, write down the story that you're afraid to tell because that's probably the one that people need to hear. Take risks and, and, and with great risk comes great reward, but, but just be bold, you know? And, and you're making an independent film and you, it's your movie, you know? If you're making a, a short independent animated film or whatever kind of movie you're making, it's yours. And that's an incredible opportunity. I would completely echo what Will just said. It's like, you're gonna run into a lot of no's and you just have to like let those slip past you and keep going. And it's, it's about perseverance and not stopping because it's like, even you know at the end of the day, you're just gonna keep chipping away. Then all of a sudden you'll look back and go, oh my gosh, look how far we've come. And as far as story is concerned, like for where we're coming from, um, you know, take that time on that script, take that time on that idea, really develop it, do put in the work. And I think, you know, when you, when you find the thing you're passionate about and the story you want to tell, you just have to put in the work. And I think, you know, sometimes people look at the end and they go, oh man, look, look at that. You got into those film festivals, you achieved this thing. It's like, yeah, but it was, it was three years of work that got us to that one <laughs> festival. It wasn't just the application. <laughs> And, and enjoy the process. I mean, some of the happiest days of my life were working on this film when we were totally lost, you know? That's part of it. You have to enjoy the process. That's beautifully said. With that, uh, we um, are out of time, sadly. Thank you for giving me some of your precious time. Maria, thank you so much. You've been such an ardent supporter of the film. And thank you for this wonderful interview and your wonderfully thoughtful, uh, thoughtful questions.
Thank you, guys, and uh, speak to you soon.